because that that's the point with seed coins. You have to pump, and so you it, have to yeah. It's hard to disintermediate the um, core tenant of a blockchain and Satoshi's creation and the, the, the invention of blockchain, the invention of Bitcoin. It's hard to like dis, uh, separate the, I mean, when you're, when you're an investor, when you're a noob in the space, when you're, when you're a newbie and you're just hearing about crypto and you're hearing Bitcoin's going up and I just want to Google buy Bitcoin and then you see Ethereum and all these other things and you're like, oh, these are all the same conversation. I should get this one. It's cheaper. And then it's hard to really go and look at it and then understand that Bitcoin is decentralized as a core tenant and censorship resistant. And a full node is important because it's sovereignty. And a full node in Bitcoin allows you to actually like cliche be your own bank doesn't mean you have to, but the, the threat that you can do that is what keeps Bitcoin valuable. And Ethereum, the, the narrative is, look at all these interesting smart contracts. It's kind of like Bitcoin because it has nodes. You can run a node just the same as Bitcoin. And, you know, but, but you can do DeFi. And now, all the, you know, you can put Bitcoin on Ethereum. And like, so then therefore buy the ETH token because it's cheaper than Bitcoin. And it's going to be like, opening up the entire world of, of, uh, of, of finance, like the quadrillions of dollars of derivatives and, and synthetic like, assets are going to be on Ethereum because of DeFi. And you can do it all in a full node, just like Bitcoin. So it has the same properties as Bitcoin. And that's the thing that's like, I try to, I try to intellectually be honest about the, the technical side of Ethereum versus the technical side of Bitcoin. And then also the ETH token and the BTC token. And it's tough because the BTC token, like the Bitcoins, are such a different product than the ETH token. And the ETH token should be looked at like AWS credits or Amazon stock or or like a, a, a stock, a stock, right? maybe a bit of decentralized network properties in there, but Bitcoin is a totally separate thing. So it just triggers me when I hear smart people and investors saying Bitcoin and Ethereum as when they're talking about cryptocurrencies, like, Oh, you guys should get some gold. You should have some Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like, no, you should have stocks in Ethereum yeah, and Ethereum and you should have Bitcoin. <laughs> you should have gold and Bitcoin and you should have stocks in Ethereum. That's the kind but, of way that I think well, about it. Well, and I'm, I'm not entirely I'm not really convinced you should have stock in Ethereum because the point no, is I don't. Stock, I don't think so either. I don't recommend I mean, the, having the, any. The, the, the cost. The, the cost of stocks is legal compliance. That's the cost. So you have to be a certified KYC, ML, qualified investor. That's the cost. The technological platform is irrelevant. If you have to add the the, the compliance cost of being a qualified investor, blah blah blah, plus the bother of the loading an Ethereum wallet. That's, that's not an advantage. That's just an additional friction that you have to do. So I, I don't think that you, I mean, uh, the, the, the reason that maybe you will have stocks on RGB, I hope so, maybe in, in 20 years, will not be because it's, it makes sense to have stocks in RGB. It will, if it will be, it will be just be because everybody already is using Bitcoin for Bitcoin itself. Mm -hmm. And so everybody already is using tools, libraries, software, hardware, keys, infrastructure. At that point, using the same stuff for stocks is just a cost saving, but only after, uh, I mean, it's like, uh, imagine that you have a private internal um, uh, uh, company portal for digital portal for your employees. And you are in 1995. And, and now you have to think that you have to adopt the open internet. So you adopt the a, a web portal, but then you create a closed web, por web portal only for your employees in 1995. That doesn't make any sense because if, if your purpose I'm gonna is- I'm going to keep listening. I'm, I just gotta, I gotta roll my back out. Like this stuff is actually causing me so much stress in my back talking about this and thinking oh, about actually, it. Actually, I, I really have, uh, I really also have uh, very few minutes left. So, okay. Uh, so feel free to do whatever exercise you <laughs> I'll want. Hang, I'll have hang to. upside down on there while you keep talking. Okay, sure. <laughs> so my point is that in 1995, you don't use the internet for your portal. You use a mainframe. And that makes sense because the internet is useless for your controlled, uh, permissioned, closed use case. You want control 
you want protection. So you don't want the internet, you want the mainframe. But then if you do, if you ask the same question to a company in 2015, that's, that's completely different because now you still want protection, control, permission, uh, compliance, but now everybody is using the internet for the internet itself. So your employees are, they all, they all have a smartphone with the internet. You already, uh, Cisco is creating a giant infrastructure. So now it does make sense to take the open internet and to build something closed on top of the open internet because right. everybody's using the internet already. But it doesn't make sense before everybody uses the internet. So after Bitcoin is used by everybody as digital gold, it may make some sense to issue stocks on top of Bitcoin, but not now. Right now, it's just so you're so you're, you're you're kind of saying then that in this in this example that you're talking about that the closed intranets that these companies are building, these well-funded VC-funded companies are building their own intranet as if it was in the 90s during the dot-com bubble or whatever. And then, like, I think Bill Gates was trying to compete with the World Wide Web or something. Was he, he was trying to make that work versus the internet, like the open internet. And so you're, you're saying that, like, Ethereum and consensus are, like, the private companies building uh, the private networks or the, or the, there's a lot of funding and a lot of development resources and all this stuff going towards building these things on Ethereum, but that the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin is the internet and it has the Lindy effects and it has the users, the most usage. It has the most chance of becoming the real open blockchain that everybody ends up using. And that these people that are building these DeFi protocols and, you know, all this stuff that that's getting all this funding from VCs. Once, once the eyeballs are all over here on Bitcoin, they're just going to move to Bitcoin. Is that kind of what you're you Yeah, I think we're witnessing to, of course, the history never repeats itself, uh, literally, so it, it will be different. But I think that what we are seeing uh, may be very similar to a mix between uh, uh, the protocol wars of the beginning of the 90s and the dot-com bubble at the end of the 90s, all together. So the protocol war was actually even before the 90s, was even in the 80s, when the internet was developing and when people were starting to realize the potential of the TCP IP protocol, everybody started to try to create their own version of internet. Xerox, Intel, Microsoft, L, every, literally everybody that tried to replicate the internet, even regulators like uh, the ISO OSI consortium, they tried to create a new version of TCP IP version 7 to replace TCP, to replace the TCP IP version 4. So they, 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 this, that phase, which is called the protocol war, it, it lasted for many, many years, but eventually it converged over the internet. Then there was another phase that was at the end of the 90s, there was a dot-com bubble. So since the internet was working, and the internet was creating an asset that was a scarce valuable asset. So it was the domain, the dot com. Actually, it was not really the internet, it was the, the more centralized um, uh, and, and service provider, name service provider. But, but anyway, since there were a scarce asset like the dot com uh, domains, you had the bubble of, of uh, these scarce assets. And that created a huge expectation on the market and then a collapse. And, and what is happening with altcoins and private blockchain is like the two, uh, the two moments together. You have a protocol wars, but instead of being a protocol wars, only fought on the level of engineers insulting each other. I mean, the protocol wars at the beginning of the night was not a peaceful thing. It was called wars because if you look at the, uh, of the, if you look at the chronicles of the protocol wars, people was really into a holy crusade and there was the majority of, it, of serious engineers defending the open standard, the internet, and they were very passionate uh, business company guys or regulator guys trying to force their alternative. And it was very hard fought, but uh, it was without strong financial incentive, which came after during the dot-com bubble. So what we are seeing is that like the monstrous merging of dot-com bubble, uh, 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 dot bubble euphoria plus mm -hmm. Uh, technical confusion during the protocol wars all right. together in this giant hybrid and uh, hydra 
Yeah, so so it's, it's as you as you can see from as you can listen from the surrounding. I think my my free time without interruption is basically <laughs> over. So I have to cut well, thanks. Here. Yeah, thanks for the chat. We should talk again. I meant to talk to you about two completely different things, and we ended up going to the trace and the Ethereum subject. So we'll have to chat again. <laughs> Let's let's do it again. Maybe maybe next week. Now I I really have to to answer to my my very young boss. <laughs> Thanks. See you later, Giacomo. Thank you. Bert. Bye.